And the only reason why I made the team is because they didn't make cuts. And our team sucked hey, even more than the basketball team. We were like 20% winning record. And that kind of gave me another opportunity to compete. And I've sat the bench for two years, unfortunately. Um, and not to say that sitting on the bench is a bad thing. I actually think sitting on the bench is a really important experience for everyone to have because it builds character. It makes you earn your playing time. What I mean by unfortunately is because the person who played over me missed 30% of the practices, never set the nets up, always came late, left early, and just was a rock star because the coach treated him like a rock star, unfortunately. Even though I was there early, busting my butt, and, and, and trying to be a part of the team. Common theme I hear from athletes I know or have worked with that go from college to pro is the big drop off in organization, systematic development, and then care for the athletes. And it's not like a sentimental care, it's literally what recovery modalities are there available. Just that bag of ice, or in like Italy, the famous one is like, oh, just spray it. Like, just, just, spray, spray it. just spray it. Yeah. You can, you can handle the heat. Yeah. You can, you can handle the heat. Out of you can handle the heat. Welcome back to another episode of Can't Handle the Heat. It's your boy G Swizz. To my left, I got Jokesy, my brother. How are we doing, Jokesy? Doing great. Next to you, so can't be better. Always. And uh, Micah is currently, again, in the most southern part of Europe, uh, playing the championship in the Turkish League. He's down, well, by the time this podcast releases, maybe he'll be back home. Um, also, if you hear a loud screeching or a screaming in the background, that's the screeching of my dad's under 10 team uh, trying to complete a service drill. So we, uh, we apologize for that. Um, but without further ado here, it's not just us two here. We're here with a legend. One of the greatest, if not the greatest volleyball creator of media of all time. I would say he's like a father figure to me. We have the... Coach Donnie from Elevate Yourself. Coach, hey, thank you so much for coming, brother. Thank you so much for coming. What's up? What's up, Out of System? Thanks so much for having me. Should I look at you guys or the camera? You can look at us. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah. It's I've, I'm also a fan of Out of System. And I, I shared with you guys that when we did our first content session. But when you guys first came out, it was, well, first, I, I learned about you guys from Pack Room, like coaching club, hearing about you guys, watching you guys rise. And then at U of H, and then knowing that you guys were really formalizing this content machine. And as a volleyball content creator, it gets pretty lonely. There's not a lot of us out there. Or they're just random people doing shorts and stuff here and there. But people that just love the spread, the volleyball passion, and want to just dive into that rabbit hole. Um, so, sorry, I totally went on a tangent. I think I was supposed to introduce myself. No, 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 not at all, not at all, not at all. First of all, that's literally what we do on this podcast. There's, there's a plan, and we just go hard right from that plan. So don't even worry about that. We love that. No, but we, I, came, I first came across you was when you were posting your Stanford videos and then your jump training. I was like, elevate yourself. And then I was like, huge, huge audience. I was like, this is amazing. I just, like I said, you have so many videos. You come out with so many. How many videos a week do you come out with? I post long form every other day, and then now I post short form once a day. Got you. And, well, just the sheer amount of content that you come, that's coming out, I just, like I said, so easy to dive uh, down a rabbit hole there. And from then on out, I was just like, can't stop, won't stop, you know? And the good thing is you're also doing side quests now. You're playing grass, which is some of our favorite type of volleyball. You're playing six man. You're playing all indoor, it, it, any variation, which we love. And out of system here, we always try and spread the love and uh, the message is like, just play it all, just play it all, you know. Um, but you'd mentioned about being a vir uh, viral, but I had mentioned about being um, a volleyball creator for media and whatnot, and how lonely it can be. Um, a few questions before I get into that. I just kind of want to hear your background in terms of one, your background because we had shot some videos today, and I was extremely impressed with how much knowledge you knew about just the body in general and mobility and um, your background in maybe kinesiology or, or, or whatever expertise you have. And then also, how did Elevate Yourself start? Great question. Uh, so I think I actually forgot to introduce myself. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm, yeah. No, no, that's not your fault. Yeah. You, you <laughs> asked me the question, and I went straight for the exciting part, <laughs> straight for the dessert. Uh, but I'm Coach Donnie from Elevate Yourself. Um, thank you so much for listening and being on the podcast and for having me here. Uh, I'm a volleyball content creator, personal trainer, and volleyball coach. Okay, now to your question, your second question. 
So a little bit background about myself. I was born probably like one of the slowest athletes known to man, but extreme intensity. I remember hearing a story that I think Joe shared about when you guys were little, I'm talking about like three and, and five or something, you guys would be outside and like playing with sticks and you'd be scheming something and then Gage would be like just staring off into space. But you guys would come up with some type of game or some type of to like express this intensity that you guys had. I, am, am, I, am I remembering that story correctly? Yeah, I, we always were together and I was always scheming because I always got Gage in trouble because I would convince him to do stuff. But we played every game. like So yeah. We, oh, yeah. we tell a lot of stories about that. But yeah, we grew up playing every single game. We were ex hyper competitive. I've, I, I was the same way. I think I had this inner fire in me, but I didn't know what it was. I just thought I had a hot temper and things would trigger it, like when I would lose or when I felt like someone was getting picked on or bullied, some intensity in me. Um, now, unfortunately, I was, I'm was i not too tall. I'm 5'10", so for the international listeners, I think that's 173 centimeters, I think. That's impressive. I don't even know my, I live over there. I don't even know my centimeters. I only memorized that because I got so many questions from international fans. <laughs> in meter system. Why Americans only use? <laughs> I was like, sorry, I gotta, I gotta learn the, the metric system. Um, so in elementary school, I loved sports. Now my parents, they came from kind of a war-torn time, so they escaped China during the Communist Revolution, um, got smuggled into Hong Kong. Hong Kong was under British rule, and the only way you can get out at the time is you got to be a, a huge hustler, like build a business from the ground up. I'm talking about food cart to restaurant, multiple restaurants, or you gotta do really well in school. And so fortunately my parents both did really well in school. So they came here for college, um, but they didn't have a lot of athletics cause they just didn't have time for that. To them, they were just trying to survive. And so growing up here at a combination of like Western, Eastern culture. So speak the language, eat the food, understand my culture, but at the same time, being raised by the American society that valued sports at a really high level. And so that was always a struggle with me. My parents allowed me to play sports, but they didn't know how to support me in a deeper journey. It was like, oh, this YMCA camp, or we drive by Warm Springs Field and we see like a, an eight week season for Little League T-ball, and then we try to sign up for that. Um, and for them, because they didn't value as much, we never really spent a lot of money. And so the most I've ever went was like an eight week Little League T-ball. And you know, the coaches are usually just high school kids that want a summer job and, and um, don't want to have anything to do with kids, right? Oh, yeah. But for me, it was like the Olympics every single time. It was like, I'm gonna hit this T-ball. And I never could hit it. I would just hit the, the, the T and never the ball. Uh, so even though I sucked at sports, I just loved it so much and I didn't understand why. And when I was in sixth grade, Mr. Elio, my PE teacher, um, I think he saw my passion for sports. And so he put me on the track and field team and the cross country team. And we would go travel and play other elementary schools. And I was last place in every single event. And I was running ugly, like saliva. Blah, blah, blah. And then there's like 10 feet, 20 feet of the next person, second to last place in front of me. And it never dawned on me that, wow, I am so bad, but Mr. Elio put me on the team. And I think it's because he saw that sports passion, this competitive fire. And I think if it weren't for him, to just affirm me in that and give me opportunities to compete, I might not be here. So fast forward, I got cut from the seventh grade, eighth grade, and ninth grade basketball team, even though I practiced every day. Like I said, I was just born with a very unathletic body. And I was, so, I was pretty down, um, and I got cut from a school where our team already sucked. We were like below 500. So I got cut from a bad team that had a freshman team. My friend said, you should come try for volleyball. And so I did my sophomore year. And the only reason why I made the team is because they didn't make cuts. And our team sucked even more than the basketball team. We were like 20% winning record. And that kind of gave me another opportunity to compete. And I sat on the bench for two years, unfortunately. Um, and not to say that sitting on the bench is a bad thing. I actually think sitting on the bench is a really important experience for everyone to have because it builds character. It makes you earn your playing time. What I mean by unfortunately is because the person who played over me missed 30% of the practices, never set the nets up, always came late, left early and just was a rock star because the coach treated him like a rock star, unfortunately. Even though I was there early, busting my butt and, and, and trying to be a part of the team. Uh, my junior year, uh, I was about to quit because like, man, if I'm not even gonna give a fair shot, then just do something else, play video games or something. Um, one of my teammates got injured and I got my chance. And I remember when I got subbed in, 
I just remember if I get my opportunity, I'm just gonna hit the crap out of the ball. I'm gonna close my eyes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a fist, and I'm just gonna wail at it. I got nothing to lose. Like, I'm not coming back next year. Season's gonna be over in five weeks. And that's what I did. And I, I just did a huge haymaker, and it ended up landing in. And then everyone cheered, and I was like, whoa, that felt pretty good. Let me see if I could do it again, with my eyes open this time. And I did it again, and again. And eventually, I got pretty good pretty fast. But that was because during the two years that I was sitting on the bench, I was studying. I was really trying to mimic. Um, my coach was, was gave us some technical feedback. She really was great at teaching us how to like play with play with fire and passion. But in terms of the technique, I had to always ask our upperclassmen, or I had to study people. And so when you when you're not giving direct instruction, you just have to imitate think people you think are good. And so that's what I did. So I mimicked the best skills of each player. So middle blocker, I was like, how do I, how does his hands look? And I would just practice before and after. They had like a tennis wall. So I would just hit against the wall and practice the arm swing of our best attacker and things like that. And so I developed a toolbox of training myself to develop these skills through observation and studying. So by the time I got my shot, I was ready. So the reason why I'm telling, sharing that story is because that is like the foundation of Elevate Yourself. Um, six years later, I went into training. Actually, sorry, my senior year, um, I knew I wanted to play volleyball at a high level, but at that time, my vertical was only 20 inches. It was sadly low. I mean, more than half of my girls on my varsity team jump higher than that. And like I said, I just wasn't very explosive. I just was, I just don't have a very coordinated body. And I had a, uh, luckily I sat next to somebody who was my height, a little bit shorter, five foot nine, but could dunk a basketball. His name was Alex Ruiz, uh, founder of Hoopsphere, if you're in the Bay Area, look him up. But really nice guy. And I asked him, like, how do you jump so high? And he said, I lift weights. And you want to join me? So I went to him, 24-hour fitness with him. He had taught me how to lift weights. And that was the first time in my mind where I felt like I actually had control over my athletic journey. Because before that, I thought, whatever you're born with, that's what you're destined with. And when I touched the weight and I felt myself get stronger, I had like that, that Spider-Man moment. You guys ever, uh, the, I think it was four Spider-Man movies where he gets bit by the spider. He looks at his hands. Yeah, he looks at his hands and he walks by the mirror and he's like, ooh. That's exactly what happened to me. I was just bench pressing with awful form, <laughs> right? Like, just muscling it, just tearing my rotator cuff up. But be luckily, I, I could barely do the bar, so I wasn't lifting heavy enough to damage myself. But it was enough to stimulate some muscle, obviously. I mean, it was, I was a buck 30 at my height. So I remember, like, uh, later that month, I walked by the mirror. I was, like, fixing my hair. I was like, whoa, I actually got some meat now. Yeah. And then I accidentally started jumping higher because I was squatting. And then that kind of started a journey of, like, well, if I can control my body, let's see how far I can take it. So I was like, well, maybe I can try to dunk a basketball. So uh, this is before, like, YouTube. And now it's, it's really easy to find information. Um, but back then, this is in 2000. Uh, five to 2009, I had to go to a library. I don't know how many kids nowadays know what a library is, okay? <laughs> Not the YouTube library. <laughs> so I went to the MLK library and I had to look up slides of Soviet literature. I'm talking about ancient texts, I mean, from the 40s to the 80s when the Soviet Union was dominant. Um, actually, that's probably where a lot of the Serbian um, training system comes from, is, is the Soviet science. So I had to look up research from these slides. So you put in this film, you spin a wheel, and you can look at this, this text that's translated, and you understand what a plyometric jump is, you understand what a complex set is, and all these things. And I just started testing this stuff on myself. And over time, I developed my own system through studying the Soviet system. Like, damn, this stuff really works. So six years, I went from a 26-inch vertical to a 40-inch vertical. Wow. So I dunked a ball for the first time when I was 24 at 5'10". And I was training at the gym, so how did I start helping people? I would just train at the gym, and people would laugh at me because I was doing skips and like all this, this goofy stuff that people think are cool now. And, people, and then they would see me dunk a basketball or jump like a 63-inch box jump or jump over things. Like I would just jump on my car just for fun. When I, was, when I was done from the gym, I would just jump on my car. And people would ask me, like, how do you jump so high? I was like, well, I don't, train with me and I'll show you. And over time, after about a couple months, people wanted to pay me, but I didn't want to take money at the time because I was like, well, I'm not a certified personal trainer. Um, and so that's kind of the long story of how Elevate Yourself came to be and how I started helping people. And then 
YouTube was really a way for me to help people when I couldn't be there with them. So when I started doing private lessons for coaching and training, instead of asking the same, instead of answering the same question a hundred times, like how low should I go on my squat, or where should my knees go? Do you, you if you need to answer that, that's okay. We're filming that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Which one? Independent? Yeah. Okay. Here. You good? It's all good. Go for it. All right. Um, yeah, and then I just start making YouTube videos to just send to my clients so I don't have to ask the same question. And that's where the following started growing. And then I remember posting some volleyball examples of me jumping as a way to demonstrate proper jumping technique. And then people started saying, well, why don't you show us how to spike then? And then just kind of steamrolled from then. So. Do you ever see, do you ever see yourself in a lot of your, uh, in your, a lot of your clients and a lot of your uh, subscribers, like your audience? Like for example, a lot, of, a lot of times what I hear with a lot of uh, content creators is like, I wish I had this or I see myself in this person and I want to help them this, like, this bad. You see, is that the case with a lot, of your, uh, a lot of people you work with? Yeah, I think a lot of the fans identify with the underdog mindset and I, I, get, I probably get mostly undersized athletes in terms of ones that watch my content right. um, just because they can identify with that. Got you. Yeah. Do you so do you, ever, do you ever see like a lot of college programs lifting or, or in terms of volleyball for like either men's or women's? Do you, have you ever taken a look into that yeah. by chance? So I work, I've worked with a couple of collegiate athletes. So one beach athlete from um, UC Berkeley, um, Ohlone College, so some of the local universities and colleges so I've had a, definitely had a chance to study some of what they do. And like, what's like the biggest change you had to make to them? Like, for example, you're like, you're like, okay, try and avoid this. Like, this is like something that classic, you know, this is like a very normal exercise that everyone does, but you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, is there like stuff that you saw that was like, you feel like this needs to change from what, what you witnessed for like most programs and, and what were those changes? Yeah, definitely. So I'll give I'll, the Cal program, the Cal Beach program was probably the one that I think was the most modified I had to give for the athletes working with. Right. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think they had either enough funding or didn't hire enough personnel, but they had the football, the person who did this football strength and conditioning program pretty much used that for all their sports. This was five years ago, so it might be different now. And so she was doing movements that were not going to help her. It was good for like general athletic development, like just getting stronger in all your compound movements, um, in your hips, um, knees, ankles, things like that, but not specific to beach volleyball. And so when it came to customizing her program for beach volleyball, the difference between indoor and field sports, like with the hard surface where you can push off, is there's a delay in which your body compresses the sand about one or two inches. So that's why people can't be a spring on the sand because it takes time for the foot to compress the sand and stabilize before they push off. And so concentric strength and isometric strength um, becomes more important. So isometric strength is being able to contract in a still position and a concentric strength is the unloading. So in, in field sports or hardwood sports like basketball, volleyball, like Eccentric, eccentric and concentric are the main focus. You want to go down fast and go up fast. But in, vol in beach volleyball, it doesn't matter how fast you go down. It's really how stable you can be for a moment and then push off from there because there is no rebound effect. So that was the main thing. Um, like cleans aren't really going to be that applicable for beach athletes. It's a lot of pause squats and then exploding from that position is probably going to be the best for beach. Got you. So we were filming uh, some more. We were filming content today. Obviously, maybe it's released by now, and if not, very soon. Um, a lot of stuff you were kind of you. We kind of talked about like college lifting and and like overseas lifting. You were kind of curious about that. I know Joe can kind of touch about this more about what do you kind of like about the overseas lifting and like. Cause are, are are you aware of like anything that kind of goes on in Europe a lot of the time? Yeah, I've read a couple of journals. I've had a chance yeah. to talk to some athletes about what they do overseas. I love, but not specifically. Yeah, the, well, first of all, 
the transition from college to professional is extremely different. Um, more different than any other, I mean, a lot of other sports. Anybody who goes and plays over in, uh, overseas, I think, can attest to this, that the transition from college programs, uh, facilities, and everything when you uh, to Euro- European um, situations for the most part is vastly different. And the lifestyle, you're very independent overseas. And so there's some places where pretty much, like, they have sessions, but you're pretty much on your own in terms of, like, what you're doing and lifting. Um I came from University of Hawaii, which was very structured, and I think the progress that the program made from the first year to the fourth year uh, was drastic in terms of, like, who was running it for us, um, just the plan for everything. Um, My last two years at Hawaii, we had uh, had Josh Elms, shout out. He watches sometimes. Um, He's one of the just most educated people I've ever met like on the body when I would go to any issue I would have I would go to him and he'd have immediate like program this is what we have to do this is the fix like short-term stuff to get me through matches match weekends like long-term stuff um but we were lifting four times a week on the in the off season 6 a.m start so we were we were we were up early um but we would go and it would be everything would be very structured person to person at Hawaii it's like Okay, this is a setter. He doesn't need to put on. He doesn't need you know to be crushing balls and stuff and putting on a whole lot of weight, upper body so much. Like he needs to be strong, feel good. But I don't need like every time you know you try to lift arms, like triceps, biceps. I just like feel like constricted in, in a way. For <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's just a feeling that I have. But I I like to feel strong. I like to do a lot of work on my back. Um, and he kind of put together a a mold that made me feel good and I was like feel super strong in really good shape um obviously the resources in terms of the training staff and everything like full all the time hot tub cold tub anybody we need to work on um any any type of equipment if we if they needed to they could send us out for external uh resources as well to go see like specialists and then Fast forward to going overseas, and I've been fortunate being in Germany. Um, most people say that in Germany, you have it's probably the closest to the U.S. in terms of how the stuff is done, lifestyle, and everything. But still, it's not even close. The resources and everything. It's uh, my first club. We had one full time physio, which was nice. So she was uh, fully dedicated to us. There all the time. Uh, travel with us. Not quite the same equipment or anything. It's like you know, I would say like a quarter of what we had at the University of Hawaii. But she was good. She was awesome and great. Fast forward to my my current club and the they were in like a building stage and I think now they're in a really good position and they have a lot of North American uh influence mindset influences, yeah. And so like the the lifting program and everything is similar, but you just don't lift as heavy in Europe for some reason. Everything is like really light and stuff. And I think the thing about the University of Hawaii for me was we lifted heavy and I was sore, but I felt so strong. I felt so good all the time. Um, we're overseas in a nine month season. You get points and you, your body starts fatiguing. And you see that happen with a lot of guys. And so you have to do extra work, I think, outside of the program at times in order to make sure that you get through it. Um, but you don't have the same ratio. You don't have full access to a physio before or after every single session. You don't have cold tubs, hot tubs, recovery stuff, like con- like constant stuff all the time. Food, like nutrition stations and stuff like that. So that for me is like, it's a big difference. Um, and I, I can't, I, I was about to say something about my future that I, I can't talk. I just realized yeah, I can't, <laughs> I can't bad. say. Yeah. Also, that's another thing. The clubs are also, well, aside from lifting, clubs are little strange about like announcing like like how it is like you usually sign a one-year contract a lot of sometimes at the beginning of that year you sign for the next year or somewhere else or whatever could be the the arch nemesis of the club so it's yeah. interesting dynamic but um but he was kind of like the joe had signed but he's about to go there in two three months and still not allowed to divulge the information but in terms of lifting it it's definitely something that i'm a libero right he i don't jump at all but i still the and we talked about this in the video do the exact same lifts as the other guys, you know what I'm saying? In Bulgaria, they change it up a lot. Like I said, I did a lot of explosive work. Um, but it would be for insane sets. It would be for, like, 
we would be doing 15 workouts, five rounds, 10 reps, like every other day on top of a three hour practice and playing, like day before matches sometimes. I'm like, what are we doing? And guys be dropping left and right. And the problem also is I think in Europe is the medical staff isn't set up like, in terms of sports, uh, sports science and sports kinesiology, America is ages, ages ahead of anybody, in front of anybody in terms of resources, in terms of the science. And like, for example, I, in playoffs, I had a big thing where I almost, uh, it was a possible torn meniscus. And I go to my train, I go to my doctor, the team doctor, I say, I need to check this out. I'm yelling at him after the game, I need to check this out. He looks at me, he's like, uh, I don't know what to do. I was like, you're the doctor, what do you mean? I, the, the playoffs also, and a possible torn meniscus. I'm limping around here, help me out. I have to go to then my other off-duty guy. He then rubs it around, checks it out. He's like, you are okay. I'm like, I'm okay. You just rubbed it. I was like, isn't there a procedure? There's there's very little procedure also. Like, in order to get a basic procedure, I had to go through so many hoops. He gave me cream for that night. He's like, make sure to put the cream on tonight. I was like, what? I called my mom, who's luckily, uh, who's a head, um, I used to be a head physical trainer at a, at, a, at a college. Now she's the AD at a college. Um, and she had, like, through FaceTime, performed these tests on me with Faina, our, videog- our video girl, social media girl, to see if I have a torn meniscus or not. And I had to beg for them to get me an MRI. And so it was just stuff like that where it's like, you see. I think, I think we have to be careful, though, because there are clubs out there in pole. So that's the other thing is club uh, league to league, it's like there's a stereotype. For example, Italy, it's very old school, but it's also kind of very, like, lax days called Poland. In Russia, it's like strict. You have weight coaches, and it's like you're getting you're getting swole uh, and heavy like lifting programs, and you have three or four physios working on the team. So, it also depends on their team's like budgets, uh, where you are, which league you're at, um, just the philosophy. And so, just from these are from our personal experiences. Aren't I want you? Well, that's all we can really well. talk about a lot yeah. of time. But yeah, so is in Europe, it, our biggest thing is like you were wondering. I don't want to like we were at a really good club and that was just one incident. Other than that, they were pretty good about stuff. But I would say like it gets frustrating come from a university that values these kind of things and then going overseas and it's just not the same, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That seems to be a common theme I hear from athletes I know or have worked with that go from college to pro is the big drop off in organization systematic development and then care for the athletes and it's not like a sentimental care it's literally what recovery modalities are there available just that bag of ice or in like italy the famous one is like oh just spray it like just, just, spray. Spray, it. <laughs> just spray it but like not, no organized or mandatory lifting regiments like even in even in a1 italy like some i've heard of some athletes literally just leaving practice afterward and just muscling through things when they could have gotten so much more out of you know that um, but yeah, it's it's kind of funny because in, in the U.S., I think one people always say, well, why don't we have a pro league and then the NCAA? NCAA, people are going to get so many more resources because mm-hmm. it's publicly or not publicly funded, but you're gonna, you're getting school funding to have like a whole staff. You got a sports doctor, physical therapist, athletic trainer, chiropractor, all these people, and then dedicated coaches, and so you get to have like a pro, a, a USA pro volleyball experience Mm -hmm. and then when you go overseas the sponsors are usually like a restaurant grocery store which is great but the funding is just so limited so yeah no what are you saying joe you're gonna say something no i i was was no it was yeah it's just like i said sometimes it can get frustrating because like i said you go by you have all the resources then all of a sudden blink of eye no longer there and i'm a libero i don't want to think that i need a bunch of resources and whatnot but even for even for me, there was a <laughs> last year. This, this goes along with what you were saying. I was because the clubs are responsible for them in a lot of leagues. They're responsible for providing living car. They fully furnish your apartment and everything. So it's nice. Like and, and they don't give you just crappy places usually. Like they give you nice places. But uh, I was in uh, my own apartment last year. I told him like the bed I was in just was not a super great mattress and everything. So I just went to the club and talk to them about it and <laughs> so they tell me did you try sleeping on the floor not not like the mattress on the floor like just sleep on the floor and like i i thought they were joking so i kind of laughed and they, they were not joking i'm like all right so i slept on the floor for a couple of months <laughs> and that was my solution yeah, Micah. 
Yeah, and uh, Micah had the same thing last year too. And <laughs> I'm like, that's kind of what you're dealing with in in the U.S. Like, if I would have went and told Charlie or something like <laughs> that was going on, they would get he would have gotten it uh, fixed immediately. Like, they do anything to make sure that the the athletes are feeling good because, as you know, sleep is such an incredibly important part. And I've learned that this might sound ignorant and stuff because. Like, I don't know, my brother and I, like, we, and Micah, we're all people. That's the thing about out of system, too, is, like, we literally can roll out of a van and just hop out and play, like, whatever, like, especially if it's a competitive thing. It's just, like, we, there's a button that we can push. But as we get older, we realize, too, like, there's <laughs> a lot of other things that matter, too, because you feel it. And I realize, like, when I have a good night of sleep, how much better I feel, my body feels and everything, and how much that goes into things the past couple of years. I, re I realized, I, I always knew it was important, but I like actually feel the importance of it, I think in the past couple of years. Yeah. And it comes down to like, especially at your guys' level, it comes down to one or two touches per set. Yeah. And it, like that lack of sharpness, it's like two inches too tight, two inches off. That, yeah, that sleep, that six hour sleep or eight hour sleep or good quality sleep makes a huge difference for sure. I did, have you ever played with like the time, I mean, in terms of performance, have you ever played with your like your sleep schedule by chance or anything, or like the amount of sleep? Yeah, I was doing it this year a little bit. I was, do for example, I had this thing. And if you could help me out with this, I would love you, Coach Donnie. But like I said, you're a father figure to me, so <laughs> it'd be okay if not. Um, I would. We had games like seven, eight o'clock. <coughs> for some reason, seven, eight o'clock, I would go, and everything would get kind of blurry. And I, I have like pr really good vision. Well, pretty, pretty good vision for like just normally. Seven or eight o'clock comes, lights get a little brighter. Everything just kind of gets a little, whoa. Like, 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 I always try and tell people, like, describe it. Imagine, like, you're 2 a.m. in a car, you're just kind of, like, looking out the window, and everything's a little brighter, everything's a little weirder. You know, that's how it is for me when that comes. And I'm like, is that because my sleep? I play with sleep. I started napping before, like, right before. And I'm not a big napper. I'm trying to get good sleep the night before, and then napping, I don't know, from, like, 5 to 6 or whatever, 45 minutes to 30 minutes. And I tried not napping. I tried to play with stuff. That's why I started taking a lot of pre-workout. I naturally have a lot of energy. But I need a pre-workout just so my eyes could see well. Yeah. Have you ever, like, I don't know if you've heard of anything like that. Have you heard anything like that before? I can imagine. I, so you, at 7, 8 p.m., that's when your vision starts to not be as consistent. Yeah, it's, yeah and, like, I'm really susceptible to light yeah. as well. Do you wear contacts? You said you have good I vision? I don't. I okay. don't. So I know uh, it, there's two causes. If you are awake for long periods of time, your iris is a muscle, so it's just naturally focusing in all day. It's just flexing all day. And so if it's been awake for that long, it could just be that eye muscle is just strained. And when your, eye, when your iris is not functioning properly, it can't regulate the amount of light going in your eye, which means you can't focus. It's like a camera lens. It just can't focus. Right. Um, AC, people who are very sensitive to um, air-conditioned gyms or like big gyms with a lot of dust. So lubricating eyes could help. Um, like eye drops? Eye drops, you can okay. try that. Um, that helps. Um, and what time do you usually wake up? Uh, game day, usually about like if we're home around like we have 10 o'clock serving pass. So we wake up around or 9 o'clock sometimes. So, like, so usually I can get like decent amount, but I mean, occasionally there'll be some games. And I guess just maybe even in the afternoon, I start to feel it yeah. where we have a 3 p.m. game. That means you have an 8 a.m. serving pass. So maybe not the best sleep beforehand, I guess. And then a, another possible cause could be low blood sugar. So I don't know how your what your nutrition is throughout the day, but whenever we have low blood sugar, our, our body just can't regulate a lot of the same functions, um, especially when it comes to focus. Um, so what does what your pregame meal look like? So wake up, we don't eat anything normally. Occasionally, we don't really we don't eat breakfast. Now we well now we're home since our sleep schedule is a little off. We get really hungry in the morning, so we've been eating oatmeal a lot. Um, occasionally, like for example, Fana's there, we stop by the bakery, get a croissant or something like that for like breakfast. Then we go to certain pass video, get back by around one or two ish. We get, we always make the same pasta. We make pasta bolognese with ground beef, just normal like ricotta, um, tomato sauce, a um, little bit of bread, a little garlic bread, bread on the side. And uh, we have that before lunch and then what? four or five hours before the game, six, maybe eight, eight hours before the game at times. Um, and we, that's our meal every single, uh, every single, uh, game day. So nothing like a couple hours, like one or two hours right before the match? No, we munch on like, uh, apples and bananas occasionally during the game, but I didn't do a great job of that. I have, at the beginning of the season, I did a really good job, but then afterwards I didn't do a great job of that. 
It could, yeah, you could try increasing your sugar intake before the game. Okay. Um, How early before the game? Everyone's different. So some people like it like an hour before. Some people feel like they're too heavy or their body's still processing it. Um, and then also sunlight exposure could, could also impact your body's ability to regulate focus. So um, at, you say you take a nap in the afternoon. Yeah. I notice that sometimes when I go for a walk, sometimes I do feel a little better. Maybe because I'm in the sunlight. Do I not want to be in the sunlight? Getting sunlight exposure immediately after you wake up, generally in the mornings, uh, helps just set your circadian rhythm. And then also just signals for your, your brain that it's time to wake up, let's focus hardcore. Um, so maybe after you take a nap, try to get some, don't be, obviously don't look directly at the sun. <laughs> Sure, we've all done. Come on, big game tonight. Come on, I need this. <laughs> oh man! Like exposure, just taking a walk. Like usually, just looking this way and just getting in there might help a little bit um, to kind of re refocus and to tell your brain it's time to focus. Because um, it could be also a delayed like grogginess from taking a nap. Like as pro athletes, for sure, you guys need to be taking naps um, midway, especially for double days. Um, but sometimes we need extra assistance for our, our, our minds to calibrate. Because I'm sure you've had that experience where like, you feel fresh, but not sharp. And like, my body is not doing exactly what I want, but I feel okay. And a lot of that is like our nervous system not firing really on point as is. And so sunlight is a good way to sync that up. And then like you said, would it be just like fruits or would it be like processed sugar, like a Snickers bar or something in terms of... I, so that one I, I would experiment with. Okay. Like I've tried yams. For me personally, I've tried yams. I've tried all the, the healthy lean stuff and Snickers and McDonald's breakfast just charge me up and keep me focused. Like I feel no jitters. I feel like I can run through a wall. Um, I've tried like ground turkey and all those ones. So I, I definitely would try to start with the healthier end of the spectrum mm -hmm. and healthier as in um, lower on the glycemic index, meaning high in fiber, but still lots of sugars. So um, yams, I don't know what, I'm trying to think about what There's the yams, German. Like, like, yeah, yeah. Would apples uh, fall into that? Apples are good complex carb, but for athletes, I, do you guys feel like sometimes after warm, I like, dude, I just burned everything I ate. You guys ever sometimes, feel that? Yeah. So I think as pro athletes, even during the warm up, because the adrenaline is ramping up, your, your metabolism is so high leading up to that. Um, and then also your base metabolism is already generally high, especially if you work out in the morning, it's gonna be elevated the whole day. And then stack that with a game prep, you're like, I just burned my entire meal and I, have, I haven't even started the game. So I think Snickers bar would be all just good to have in your bag when you feel that lack of focus. Um, try to think about what's available. I, uh, are all the like American produce available in Germany too? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, something with skin. So a sandwich, I, 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 I think sandwich is a really good combination. They have all your macronutrients. You got carbs, fats, protein, um, and you put lettuce in there so you get the, the fiber from that so you're not getting a spike in your, in your blood sugar and you just get like a stable energy. So. Oh, sorry. It's all good. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, definitely, for, I got to play with that for sure because it, 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 for me it became a problem to the point where like I feel like I can't control um, like my play at times. Yeah. So it was like, I was like, I go out there, I'm like, I can be ready, but I'm like, my eyes aren't ready. But at the same time, I don't want to be like, oh, in my head, I'm like, like the, you don't, you don't want to be like, oh, I'm freaking myself out at the same time, you know? But at the same time, it's literally like, it's like crap. Yeah. Ball's flying at me. I need to make sure I'm good here. And it's a little harder to see, you know what I'm saying? And I got to take, as a libero, you got to take any, anything you can get in serve receive. Yeah. Um, with, uh, I kind of want to talk about diet for a second here. Um, first off, you might be saving our careers here, so thank you very much, Coach. Um, we recently, for example, do what do you think about not eating in the morning? For for me, it's the reason why I do it because one, I'm not hungry. Two, I feel at times like last year I had a, I had an eating problem last year in Bulgaria. I went to two ends of this one end of the spectrum. I got there, they're like, you're too fat, you need to lose weight. Okay, so they, what they would do is they can't eat breakfast. You're gonna eat a, a fillet chi of chicken breast fillet about this big, and cucumbers for lunch, an apple, and then another th same thing for dinner. And I was starving all the time, but I was losing weight. I was shedding weight, but I felt like crap. And then I got to the point where I, they allowed me to eat, and then I just lost complete control of where, and I got like really fat. I got to the point where I was like, 
220, maybe a little 222. I think we weighed ourselves myself at uh, at 24 hour fitness, and I was like, okay. And this year, I feel like I found a good medium. I, I think I need to shed some more weight because I got to be hitting here. I was I was I was fine with barrel form, but I need to be you know in the summers so I got to be hitting a little more. Um, one thing we we rely on a lot of the time is, is a big meal we ate in Germany is chicken, rice. And kind of salad and fish, rice and salad, um, and just kind of eating that every day for the most part. Is there any? Do you think we could add add some stuff to that, or is it, is there like? Yeah. yeah. I think those are great choices, and I think it's that's a good question. So the body is the best. Like everyone, just like your trainer at U of H, that customized things for your body. It's like, well, he probably knows that your arms would feel too heavy if you lifted too much. Same thing with diet, like if you don't feel hungry in the morning but you have energy, that's great. Like that's, that's it's actually easier to maintain calories if you can fast in the morning as long as you feel you have, you, you have energy in your workouts. Yeah, for sure. Okay, perfect, yeah. So I would say hunger is generally a good, as for pro athletes, it's generally a good sign that, you know, I need to put something in my body. So if you're not hungry, then that means you just have enough sugar in your, your liver and your bloodstream that's just there for ready to use. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to your diet throughout the day, um, the the chicken, the fish, the rice, I think those are really good options. Uh, do you add vegetables to that? A salad. We have a salad with about salad. Uh, we cut up pretty much half of, if not a full bell pepper, uh, a full mini, cu two full cucumbers, and occasionally like shards of um, carrot. And then Joe makes a homemade mustard. Honey mustard uh, dressing. Kind of. We yeah. We can literally eat the same meal every day. Like we. That's just yeah. Yeah. It's like clockwork. I would play around with actually adding beef. Now, do you guys know why the the societal trend is kind of going away from beef, other than the environmental factors? I think I heard like it causes like a lot of inflammatory or people. I've heard I I don't know the science behind this, but I've heard like it causes inflamed your joints to get inflamed and muscles inflamed and does it's bad for security. Um, so yeah, so that that I don't know. You would know better than I would though. Yeah, there is definitely some associations with inflammation. Um, it's also more complex for your stomach to digest. And so when, as an athlete, you need to absorb stuff faster so you can recover faster, get the energy you need, and then recover again and cycle through. Um, but in terms of the actual experience, like anecdotal experience people I've worked with and me personally, I, feel, I, just, for, I just feel really good when I eat beef. And it sustains my long-term energy. I feel satiated longer. I keep all the fat on there. Um, and especially for my female clients that are trying to stay lean, but due to menstrual cycles, they lose a lot of blood. So they, they lose a lot of iron. Uh, but beef is rich in so many minerals that your body needs that fish and chicken don't have. Um, and like I said, it's more satiating. So I would actually play around with seeing what beef does to your body. Now, some people are just sensitive to that. Then obviously you can't go in that direction. Um, but I would say leaner meats for right before playing so you don't tax your nervous system or your digestive system because if blood has to go here it mm -hmm. can't go to your muscles right um and then if you know you have a, a long training period where you have a break like six hours until my game then i think that's like four to six hours is a good amount of time to let your the beef break down in your system without affecting you or you can finish with beef so you are recharged for the next day got it so I, I would say just play around with that and, and slowly introduce it. If you guys are accustomed to chicken and fish daily, I wouldn't go all beef because that's going to throw off your, your digestive system. Um, I would just put it like once every other day, kind of slowly introduce it and just talk to each other about how your, your workouts feel. But more often than not, I have found that athletes feel better when they eat beef. Um, uh, um, uh, as there might be a few exceptions for older athletes that are highly sensitive to inflammation, but there's other ways to mitigate that, like just reducing the simple carbohydrate intake. Because if anything, processed sugars actually contribute the most to, in my, uh, nutritionally, processed sugars contribute a lot to inflammation. But you, like for you guys, if it's just rice, and as long as you eat that with, um, that with meat, then it's not going to operate, it's not going to spike your blood sugar in the same way that's going to affect it.
Got, got you. you. We have a uh, ground beef patty. I forgot to say we we it's normal to have ground beef patties for lunch. Okay. Um. So that's something we do regularly. Sometimes with potatoes as well. Um. So we kind of mix it up occasionally. Sometimes like that. And then last last kind of stuff for nutrition before I kind of change topics here is we don't get a lot of sun uh, when we're over there, and that can can you hear a lot of players. I mean, due to a number of reasons overseas, um, depression kicks in. Uh, you feel like you're not your best. Low energy a lot of the time. I just feel at times I just feel like the life sucked out of me at times. A lot Especially more. Especially when you lose, you lose. Energy's bad. No sun, you wake up. It's like you can get into like it's difficult yeah. at some points. Yeah, and and I know people take like vitamins for stuff like that. I know some people go like Colton, our teammate, he goes tanning beds. And just that feeling of being a little summer, you know, revitalizes you. Uh-huh. Um, do you have any recommendations and for someone? And maybe they don't live overseas, but they live in Seattle. I don't know. Like, like don't get the California sun or the Hawaii sun like we do. One, I consulted one athlete who played in, in Finland and I was ooh, ooh. zero sunlight. And then you go through periods, I think for the Northern Lights or something, where it's just like, you get you know, light too much. But I, was, I, was, I, just, I highly recommend vitamin D supplementation if you can't get it naturally. Um, that's actually in like a, a new trend right now for high school athletes because we spent so much time indoors, people that end up breaking bones easily, we thought was due to low calcium stuff, like calcium deficiency, but it's actually low vitamin D. So with mood for sure, um, but just overall health, it just, I definitely recommend vitamin D supplementation. Got you, yeah. I got you. Like I said, you could be a lo- long, 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 do the longevity or help the longevity of our careers. So we really, really appreciate that. Cause I, like I said, that I stuff I've been trying to, trying to nail for a long time but I, I kind of want to shift gears here into uh and in media here because um that's definitely your speciality or one of your many specialities with volleyball what, I, what i've come to realize is volleyball well i think the difference between us and you is you're so good and you focus on more educating people right in terms of how to increase your vertical why this player is so good um in terms of how to do a skill. And I think what I think for us and something that and we're we're different in terms of we're more focused on I guess being goofballs, I would say at the end of the day, like hosting events and just, you know, Gage goes streaking on camera. I don't know, just stuff like that along the lines, you know, hopping in a van and, and having a good time. And I think that's where we're kinda of focused on. I think that I think obviously we have very differing approaches to the media. Um but at the same time I think there's some stuff that we, I know for a fact there's a lot we can learn from you. Um, and one thing I kind of learned just overall about volleyball, a lot of time we don't have the luxury of just, for example, last summer we were just throwing everything we were doing on there, right, On which is completely fine. but And it could be okay content, but in reality we're men's volleyball players. And we're, you know, for example, unless we're teaching something, a lot of time or you're watching a game, the volleyball content or the vlogs or whatever is not going to do as well unless obviously you build your someone like you who has a huge following um, and you got to build it to that um, is making something is as volleyball creators. I realize that you cannot, you don't have the luxury of not making your content really, really good because the audience, it's not mainstream and Due to that, you can't just put, oh, day in the life, I did this or whatever, and then bunch of views, you know. Um, Is there stuff that you kind of learn? Like, also, and one other thing, TikTok, for example, the the, my anus digging or my butt digging, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if you've seen it. It's just something very, very quick, seven seconds, or the gwitty stuff. It may seem foolish, but it was all very meticulous and very planned out in terms of you have to make it very, very, very digestible for the, and very easy to watch. If you want volleyball to reach the mainstream or whatever, you need to make it extremely digestible and then get them hooked. And then you can kind of go a little more into like not so basic uh, stuff. And I don't know if you've kind of learned some stuff, but I would love to hear um, some lessons you've learned about YouTube because YouTube's we're trying to make a bigger push on that this summer um, and just kind of stuff you've learned about it. Yeah, uh, great question. I would say you guys are definitely, you definitely have an advantage over me in terms of the TikTok game. Like you guys are on point with the trends. 
and just making it like people go on TikTok. You could do tutorials and stuff, but I think the trends are really where it's at. So I think you guys are doing an amazing job on TikTok with with that stuff. Something that I need to, to work on. In terms of YouTube, I've learned that there's three reasons why people go to YouTube: to learn something, to be entertained, or to watch somebody, or to review a product. Like those are the three main categories, and so those are great gateways to get people into your content because once you get the hardcore fans i'm sure you guys know like the yeah. the regular people that comment on every video like it's about growing that base but then you need to have a larger pool to draw from and so whether it's something that because you guys love you guys are really good at the the like selling the volleyball life and i think that's it's it's very attractive this is what a professional athlete's like, but we also play grass volleyball. We, we, we enjoy ourselves, we're good people, we have fun. Um, I think for people to even find you in that respect, opening that funnel is through the product reviews, things like that, and the tutorials. Like, okay, let's see Joe teaching people how to set. And then they're like, oh, he also plays pro volleyball. Oh, maybe I can watch, like it kind of steamrolls. So that's why I found what my analytics have shown is starting from that. The tough part is like those tutorial videos, they take forever. Like to do a good job and to make it engaging, right. they take a long time, but it's worth it because long-term wise, I, I'm st I still can't get used to the fact that these really crappy tutorial videos I shot on my iPhone 5 in 720, 24 frames per second, no mic, echoey ass gym. It's like 7 million views now. It's amazing. amazing. I mean, I mean I, I, that's the first video that I watched, and then I ended up watching all, I think it was three parts, right? Or three or four parts. Watch every single one. Watch every single one. And it shows just how, like, just about the content itself. Like, if you just, doesn't matter. Because people always say, and even filmmakers say, don't need a fancy camera, don't need this. Learn how to make a story. For example, learn how to make a high quality video. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no that's, that's so then that was the gateway to like the, the hardcore people that will watch the vlogs and, and the regular stuff. I mean, for me, I always like, man, why the heck do people watch me play open volleyball? It's like, <laughs> they should be watching, like you guys are like Matt Anderson, but then they, they some, for some reason will watch me not bounce a ball and just get a deep corner kill or tool somebody's like, oh, that's great. But I think it goes back to that funnel. And then once you get them in the funnel, I think the next step is like building the connection, the authenticity. So I think a lot of people misconstrue connection as like commenting on videos and interacting directly that way. But people, especially nowadays with reality TV and like I think social media has amplified the, the false persona trend of where like I'm gonna act one way on camera. And I think people are very leery of that. And I think people really connect with authenticity Something about that sells, and it's not to say you can't change, because right, we we change, we need to evolve as people. When I first started my jump, my channel, it was mainly jump training. Then it was volleyball tutorials. Now it's like volleyball life-ish, and and open gym videos, I guess, or like mainly about the tall ones. Um, and I think you guys are doing a really good job with that. Like I think you guys, who you guys are on camera is pretty much who you guys are off camera. Yeah. Um, just without like the sunglass, the really big sunglasses, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and yeah. So yeah, I would say that's that's kind of how I've grown that. I, 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 yeah. I, well, I was gonna ask. So, take yourself back to your first starting. Elevate yourself, uh, the brand and the video and the videos that you're just referring to. With all that you know now and everything that you've went through up to this point. Going back, what is something that you would do different in the process from the start? I would have structured a regular posting schedule earlier so that one, the algorithm tends to prefer that. Like I've noticed when I post sporadically versus when I post regularly. And it doesn't have to be every day or every other day. It could be weekly or whatever. Um, getting your, because that trains your audience to just tune in, right? Um, and then writing scripts to have more well thought out uh, tutorial videos and having a sequence. I think series tend to do really well. And if I just had a series of like, okay, I'm gonna do 10 passing videos, I'm gonna lead them through these steps. Then that gives me, that makes my filming much more efficient when I have a plan. And then it gives someone, some, the fans something to look forward to. Um, and then I would chop it up. Well, actually back then there wasn't really real, so 
can't really say I would have done that differently. But now, like just chopping, repurposing, yeah. yeah, repurposing, yeah. I, uh, but there wasn't really any mode to repurpose back then. But I, I think formalizing and then formalizing long-term goals, not in terms of like I want this many subscribers, but these are this is the content I want to make. How can I make sure I get it there? And I think when you're a numbers driven which is not a bad thing. I think it's actually good to have numbers and to get excited about, oh, I'm hit this many views with that many subscribers. But if, you, if, if, if people let the numbers dictate the content, then the content becomes random. And I think people can see through some of the inauthenticity of that. So yeah, in summary, I think I would have had, I would have planned my material a lot more ahead of time. Definitely would have hit the tutorial videos as my base and then those would get viewership forever and then add stuff on top of that, and then um, make more series, like plan out more series so there's more consistent content versus, I think back then I was just like, oh, how do I teach hitting? Okay, this is how I'm gonna teach it. And it was just me rambling for like two hours. I was like, okay, now I think I could cut it into like one, two, and three. And then I'm like, ah, oh, shit, my demo, that looked really bad. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, but if I planned everything, like I have a system now and, and you guys look like you have a system where it's just so much more efficient, the content comes out better. So that's what I would have done. I, yeah. yeah. As, I was, as I was telling you, uh, definitely making a shift and a, and a push to more planned out, better, and also a shift in different kind of content. Um, more collab, we've been wanting to collab with you for a while, so we were like, we gotta make this happen. I'm so glad, again, thanks for being patient with us. Um, challenges and whatnot and a lot more just interactive content even with just like people in the street i'm not going to give anything away to our listeners we can talk about it after but not that they care that much or anything like that but it's kind of a rabbit hole um but i have two questions to go off you or to go off that first question do you ever have imposter syndrome all the time all the time and it doesn't i don't think it comes from a place of insecurity like when i'm on the court i feel good about what i can do i don't back down like, I, I try to even envision myself, like, what would it be a, to play against Brazil? And mm -hmm. I get excited about getting shut down. Like, if I get shut down, I get shut down. So, like, I, I think regardless of whatever situation I am, I feel good about how I play. I think the imposter syndrome comes from that it still amazes me that people want, listen to what I have to say. And I put a lot of work into my ability to teach because I love teaching and I want to get better at it. And to me, the seeing the light bulb come off in someone's eyes or hearing a comment, reading a comment that says, dude, I made my high school volleyball team because of you or like you saved me from this injury because I did this like that never gets old. I think the source of the imposter syndrome just comes from like being recognized on the street and just knowing that people enjoy what I have to say or like, yeah. And I, I just, every fan that says hi, I just, it, it doesn't hit me. I, I still think I'm just some random volleyball guy that loves it a little too much and is just trying to do my thing. And then I'm reminded of like, wow, I'm actually am having an impact on people. And, and that's what I like. And then I ask myself like, why? Why wouldn't they watch so-and-so? Like, I would rather watch Real Fredo Leon hit. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think for people, one, obviously, obviously, like you said, the content needs to be educational. And you are extremely educational, to whether you're a beginner or whether you're a professional. It, it doesn't matter. Um, so I think people see that, but they also can relate to you too, right? You don't. It shows that you don't have to be Wilfredo Leon to bounce the ball or to do certain things um, or to improve your game an insane amount like you had. Um, and I think that they see themselves in you. I think maybe for our content too, they're like. I see myself in the back of that van or, you know, getting kicked out of tournaments or like, I don't know, just doing this crazy stuff. And I think that's where you see a lot of successful YouTubers. It's not the best players. It's the most relatable. It's the people that obviously have good personalities um, and the people love. And then my second question is, put you on the spot a little here, and maybe you don't have an answer to this. And this is just for me, just to improve our content. Is there anything that you think that we could be doing better? And maybe you don't watch our content that much. That's completely okay. Maybe you don't have an answer to that. But just out of curiosity, if you did have anything in the top of your mind um, or direction we should take things. Hmm. I'd have to think about that one. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I kinda, kinda, yeah that's kind of my left field. Sorry. I thought the, I think the edge that you guys have is really educating people about what professional volleyball life is about. Mm -hmm. And 
And, it, and the nice thing is it's more than just like, oh, look at me, I'm training. Look at me, I'm playing. There's, there's, you, you really feel like we're there with you cooking the bolognese or like eating the cucumber salad. <laughs> you're like, here, I'm just eating this again. Like, <laughs> you're, like you're not trying to sell it. We're like, dude, this is, <laughs> I just like I eat this cucumber. Yeah. And you're like dipping in the sauce. Like, yeah, it makes it taste better, but. <laughs> okay. um, I, I think adding, I don't, I don't want to say the downside or the negative side, but I think making it like di dive, growing that connection even deeper by talking about the struggles you said, like yeah, loneliness is a huge thing, right? But then after a, a loss of a game, you guys might talk a little bit, but like what, like let let I think let the fans really see that that struggle, because I think in the same way that you pointed out, because you're right, I think people like to watch me play. Because to them, that's like, I can achieve that level of volleyball. Like when I watch Matt Anderson, I'm like 6'10", 40 inch vertical, amazing athlete, played forever. I don't know if I can attain that. I can admire that, but I don't know if I can attain that. I think when they see me, they're like, I think I can get there. Like he's mm -hmm. average athleticism, but if he puts in the work, I think I can get there. And I think for you guys, the equalizer for the non-pro athletes is like, damn, these guys are really human. It is a, it is a uh, you guys sell the fun for sure. I think having some of the, the tough parts as well, I think would be really good. Got gotcha. you. Gotcha. Yeah, that's something, I'll be honest, luckily we've been pretty lucky for 99% of our vlogs we're, we're winning, you know? So definitely. Maybe we choose to vlog. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe, we, maybe we need to choose vlogs. We're like, right, this might be a tough one to pull out here. And just have us fighting in the backseat of the car or something. Because there would be, there, we, I mean, there have been, there was times that are like during match or whatever, we got close to fighting and, or whatnot and like, Fist fighting and stuff, which is a common a common thing between me and my brother. Or your teammates. Between me and my brother. Okay. That, that, no, that I would, we would never, never, we would never fight anybody else besides us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, I mean, there's verbal fights and just like stuff like that. Um, but, but yeah. No, no, no. no. You, just you, before I forget, I think another great thing that a growing trend I'm seeing that I'm trying to capitalize on too, is just putting your entire clinic online. So I know you guys chop it up to, but. I've been testing this with my adult Volvo camps that are running, and it's, it's probably about, each video is about 15 to 20 minutes, and I don't just stream the raw, I mean, it's, it's edited, but I think, one, I think that's gonna, just gonna grow, people are gonna wanna travel, it's like free advertisement, right. but those videos have been doing really well, because then, once again, like you're bringing people into your world, it's like, oh, I get to train with, with Joe and Gage, I get to be there for a moment virtually, it's like, oh, maybe, maybe I can go there one day, but if I don't, I'm gonna watch, so we, we know that videos that do well have longer watch time, right? Yeah. Like the people that check out after 30 seconds, I'm like, oh, shoot. Yeah. But those that are going to watch like 40 or 50%, I found that those clinic videos where it's not, you could do highlight focus for just uh, like repurposing or for short content. But I think showing like the full thing with, minim, with you know, cutting out all the pauses, I think that would be really good and just make that a series. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think so, so. What we're planning on doing with the clinics is getting our bet. For example, doing like a multiple camera, like we like we were shooting today, multiple camera um, setup. And when we're all doing demos and stuff, and luckily we have coaches from all over the country coming and players, pro players coming too, and putting our best hitting, best hitting drills, making that a video, best pat, you know, and so on and so on, making it a series. And we have three camps. Um, that we can kind of grow off of. And each camp, maybe we choose like a different uh, skill that we choose to do. And that's something I kind of had in mind is a lot of time we just record everything. It's like, okay, we can still record everything, make it like a ooze after hours where we make like a huge like 40 minute vlog of the week leading up to it and during it, you know, but also very structured content during it. Like we're going to have a YouTube video uh, videographer and also a TikTok videographer at the event. And then for a certain event, for certain drills, there'll be, both YouTube, you know, you know, it's just kind of being a little more planned out, and a little more um, thorough, yeah. and and I think uh, that's kind of the direction we're going in, making sure that. It, it, I mean, at the end of the day, it could, I'm ahead of content, so it, it, I, I got to do a better job at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, that's something that we're kind of dip into as well. Um, but we definitely appreciate any other advice you have for us. Uh, let us know for sure, because we would. We respect you tremendously, and you're obviously very successful at this. Who, who, in your eyes, in the volleyball space or just in general, creators, is somebody that you're just like really impressed by? Ooh, 
That's a tough one. It's not, not too many, many either. either. And, and I want to know, yeah, volleyball and non-volleyball. I would say for, I'll start with the non-volleyball ones because I think I, there's not a lot of variety in, in volleyball content creators. It's like either games and then a few channels like yours and mine where it's, it's volleyball life and, and right. other things and, and tutorials. Uh, and then there's volleyball world and that's it, right? And then there's like, so I'll start with the non-volleyballs. Casey Neistat, I think I use a lot of, I steal a lot from like, how can I make this talking head portion more interesting? Okay. <laughs> go to, you ever do the 30 vlog, 30 days thing? If when I, when I go full tent content creation, so probably in a year I'm gonna retire from teaching, um, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna experiment at, I'll probably risk burning myself out, but I think it would be fun because I've learned just from artwork, like just being a musician and, and being an artist, there's natural creativity where you wait for the aha idea to come and just having open space to be bored and think, like Isaac Newton, you know, bored and then idea comes to his head. And then there's induced creativity through extreme work, meaning you hunker down, you pump things out, and through quantity, you're gonna have something excellent out of that just by sheer quantity. So I think just for the experience, I think I might do that. <laughs> oh, that's so sick. That's something that we always thought about. Maybe I, I have kind of talked about Joe. You go. No, I, I, as soon as you said that, and as soon as you said the 30 days, 30 vlogs thing, the first thing I thought of, um, Deion Sanders, recent head coach of the University of Colorado, huge on content, brand building, everything. Like he's really big on this. And he brought his son actually is a rapper, content creator, has a couple of big, really big uh, social media platforms. And he comes and they literally release a vlog every single day. And it's just every day in the Colorado football building, every single day it's shot and edited on the same day, released on the same day. And it's not like crazy edits. Obviously you can't like with that time. It's pretty up. Every single day though, on the same day it's released. And that's why I, I, it, it always has me questioning too. It's like, how many, is there enough people that are interested? Like say our lives you know, like on a week, if we brought in a videographer and just, just straight like followed the team around, like how it, there's nothing like that in volleyball. Like if, a t if, if Perugia with the top, some of the top volleyball players in the world, if there's a, just a, an everyday vlog, like how would, would that be interesting to people? I think, well, I think there's two things you would mention. We had mentioned Casey Neistat releasing a blog every day and Deion Sanders. And also stool scenes, they don't do it every day. But stool scenes, I don't know, is bar stool. They have a huge headquarters in New York, so they have like a lot of personalities. All their podcasts are there, all their personalities are there, and they all work there. And just whatever goes on in in, in that week in the, in the in the headquarters, they put. I think it's week is it weekly. So and it's also not very like highly edited or anything. But Casey Neistat is impressively he, like for a vlog every day, impressively pretty well edited and very aesthetic. So I think, like I said. I think it, you you would have to, like, take example A, right? You have to build up your audience into a point where they're really big enough where they care about you. I don't think you just start out um, producing stuff like Deion Sanders. You would need stuff like Casey Neistat where it's a little more aesthetic, a little more high quality because we don't have the luxury of people caring about us. Maybe, like I said, you spent years and so many time in, in, in amazing, uh, getting an amazing fan base where I think you could pull it off. But for us right now, I don't think we could. We'd have to be a little more highly edited. And maybe we could every day, but it can't be 30 minutes. It'd have to be six minutes like Casey's. And it's some I've noticed. I mean, maybe, maybe you have a different opinion on that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think the, the main challenge, as you guys mentioned before, is that volleyball is just not that big. So the appeal would have to be definitely bigger than that. Like even for my vlogs, it's hit or miss. Like some are 100,000, some are 4,000. And mm. um, it's... Well, I, probably because I talk too much in, in a lot of my vlogs. No, 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 no. That's a vlog. They want to hear you talk. You know, it, it's, it's yeah. a, it's a, vlogs can be hard. Luckily, we have, especially by yourself, vlogging by yourself, you're like, all right, I got to be entertaining. So, you know, you're doing something like, you're like, why did I just, there's sometimes where like when I have it, like I have someone else editing or whatever, I just record something and I make another recording five seconds. I'm like, our other editor's name is Joe. I'm like. Joe, just delete that last one. I don't even know why I put that. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's hard. It's really hard. But when you have four goofballs, it makes things a lot, yeah. lot easier. 
The other channel, Blah Blah Wise, that I've been following for a long time is the Neat Kazan's channel. Have you guys seen ah, that? Ah, the POV, POV stuff. stuff. They've been on point, and they, they, I think they are trendsetters for volleyball specific content. I can't understand anything they're saying, but I've been yeah. following them since David Lee was on the team. Wow. That was OG. So they're OG YouTube. And then Matt Anderson, of course, been following for a long time. So see, seeing him part of it, but the camera angles, I don't know what it is about how they're able to film sport. I, I can't put it objectively like, oh, they got, they, they filmed it from this angle or, or this is how they're going it. Like just the rhythm. I think the rhythm of, of filming is different for volleyball content compared to NBA highlights. Like I'll watch some NBA analysis stuff or like football content. But yeah, I, I think that's the one that I try to emulate too, is the Zanit Kazan. Like the fact that I still enjoy, it, even though it's all in Russian, it's, yeah. it's, uh, I was like, some good. Do you, do you watch any of this stuff? Yes. yes. Yeah. Mike, there was a day in the life of Mike Christensen yeah. too, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on there, so that's been pretty fun. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the, when they rolled the tarp down too, and like the blind, the, I, uh, there was something they did with that. They did the BMX guy too, or like, or there was a couple of things. That, that, that was like more short term for media. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. No, I, I was just going to go in because you had mentioned that you're going to be going like full content creation here in a year or so. The, just more like personally, the, for your brand and everything in the model, is it mostly through like brand deals that you do with your gun? Or is it, I know you have a subscription service like with Elevate Yourself. What is the general model and like where do you see the future of the brand itself um, going? So the more business side, um, I, financially, I can actually go into full content creation right now in terms of like the main source of revenue, 50% is YouTube ad revenue um, between two channels. So we got Volleyball Pro Mindset, Elevate Yourself. And then the third one I'm going to start is like an anime reaction one, which is like a whole nother. Is that only Haikyuu or is it all anime? It's now all anime. So the Haikyuu fans, dude, if you guys want to boost in your viewership, just... <laughs> Just we, we, we did something like that. Obviously, it was, it was like 48 minutes. We did a podcast on reaction. Joe, sorry for our fans out there, does not like haiku whatsoever. He's not an anime guy at all. Not a fan. So he's like, it's over dramatic. And it's understandable, right? I had watched Naruto. I had, and Micah had watched many other animes up to that point. We're more open to it. Um, we were thinking, we, I don't know. It's just something that we just wouldn't. We love doing, to be honest. It's just something that not kind of, but I totally get what you're saying. 100%, I get what you're saying for sure. Yeah. If you can't enjoy it, I, people are gonna see through that. So, but if you if everything changes mind, that's like the immediate boost right there. Maybe yeah. just Mike it does it. Mike liked it a lot. Maybe you just have just, just that's Mike a series. series. Yeah. I think it's uh, bad, for sure. It could be it. And like those guys are crazy, crazy, crazy in a good way. But that it, it's such a loyal following. And I think that's a great way to just bring in new fans. Because a lot of these people that watch Haikyuu, they think it's, so it's actually a very realistic in terms of the way they animate the movements. Yeah, yeah that is so, so true. Like the, sorry to mean to cut you off, but I've noticed that like this, especially the, the form, it's like the, like, like and the whip of the arm is like, and it's also like, like cause Japanese, uh, we had, we had went to Japan in, in uh, college and they have perfect arm swings yeah. and, they, and they animate that Japanese perfect arm swing so well. Yeah. It's not, not like, and the timing of the ball, the way the ball compresses as it leaves the hands, it's all these small details, but that's because the creator actually played volleyball. And so he's also the director, so he, and then the storytelling is so relatable to people that played on, uh, on a team sports. It's not just you beat the team and then you celebrate. There's the, this journey of, of like, you can relate to so many people. Like I was that, I was that person, I was that person, I was that person. And then the rivalries of like, oh, this, this school is really good at blocking or this school, they got that one transfer student that everybody thinks is amazing or something like that. Um, so anyways, it's, it's it, at least, so I was weary of watching Haikyuu because I thought it was just gonna be exaggerated version. I was like, eh, I gotta sit through this. But I was like, dude, I feel like I'm watching my life animated and I feel like I'm watching an actual volleyball game, but with the entertainment factor of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And the reaction videos, it, it just blew things up. I, I think my channel was already still growing maybe two or 3,000 subs a month. And then when I did Haikyuu, it was like four or 5,000 subs a month. So if Mike wants to do it, it's a good way to get that intro. I, I, about about that. That. I think we struggle, not struggle, but we're 
we have a good identity in the summer, you know, in terms of our content. Like we can, okay, we're all together, one, with resources and the community around us where we can do anything, the events and stuff. Nine months out of the year, we're overseas. What do we do then? You know, it's kind of, we kind of play with some stuff this year and we had some mi some minor success, some good success towards the end of it. We started playing with some short stuff. Short form more. mostly. Yeah, yeah, short form, a little bit on YouTube, but playing with it is something that, what can we film while we're overseas and still be out of system, still be intriguing, you know? Um, so that's something that we're going to play with and get a little more daring, I think. But first things first, we need to take care of this summer, make sure we crush it, starting with Elevate Yourself, come on now. Um, but no, definitely for sure. And then, so uh, uh, he well he was finishing. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you cut you off before you were finishing. The um, I no, I, I I'm interested to hear just about the the model and stuff. Um, I know you're getting into that, and then we got into the height. The sorry, about, sorry about that. But yeah, I in terms. So most of it right now is from those three channels. You would say. Yes, so I would, so if Elevate Yourself as a company, there's private coaching, camps, online programs, so my jump training programs, affiliate partnerships, so all volleyball, which I'm so happy that you guys are also partnering with them. Yes, yeah. sir. They're awesome. They're amazing. They really are. They really it's are. That, and gals, it's, it's, a, it's a missed company. Um, very generous and very helpful and like, yeah, so I'm glad that you guys got hooked up to them, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanna give a shout out to our friends at allvolleyball.com. Use the promo code OOS for 20% off. If you wanna elevate yourself, elevate your game, like Coach Donnie here, use the promo code for 20% off. They get everything you could ever wish for in the volleyball world. Sorry, I had to give a shout out to them. All love, all love all volleyball. I always gotta shout out all volleyball. So those are the, f and then the, f the fifth one is the, um, I would say, Content platforms, so it's well when they had bonuses for Instagram Reels or Facebook. So yeah, YouTube channels, anything that comes from ad revenue from those. So I say the distribution, forty right now probably forty to fifty percent. Actually, I would say forty percent YouTube ad revenue, twenty percent coaching at camps, and then the rest of the forty was that thirty to forty percent is affiliates. Um, just random stuff that is associated with it. Yeah. So my goal in a year is to retire from teaching because I still feel like I want to have a big enough cushion to where if, because as you guys know, like ad revenue is so up and down. Mm -hmm. And I've learned, were you guys making content during the most recent ad apocalypse in 2018? We started yeah. just like a year or two after that. So the ad revenue got cut in half overnight when um, there was an accusation that YouTube was associating some, do you guys know about the ad apocalypse? I, I, heard, I, I heard about it, but I didn't really, because I didn't have a YouTube channel at the time, so I didn't look too far into it, but I know a lot of people left the platform. Yeah. Um, and the PewDiePie left the platform during the time, or, or he was like ad, or I don't know, I don't know, a lot of big YouTubers were like, this is not good, and yeah. So um, for those who don't know, for the listeners who don't know how the ad works, so companies will pay YouTube, to put an ad and then they will share that commission for every time there's an ad engagement, either clicking on the ad or watching it. And so it could be like $7 a click or 10 cents a click, however much. But when the ad apocalypse came, there was an accusation and screenshots where there was ads posted on, I think some ISIS videos or some extremist videos. And that supposedly that's like a one in a million chance, but this person was able to recreate it multiple times and so when they published this in like a Wall Street Journal or Washington Post, one of those article, Mercedes-Benz, like the top 50 big ad companies pulled out. And so within that, within a month, it dropped in half. And then YouTube had to make a huge changes. But since they've got all them back, it was never to the same amount in terms of the CPM or RPM. Um, so from there, what I learned was I had to diversify my, if I was going to focus on ad revenue, I had to diversify. So I actually just started a Facebook platform. Do you guys use Facebook at all? We have our Instagram automatically posted to our Facebook, but it's something that I got to take a better look at because I know with TikTok going down the, well, it's not looking good for TikTok. And I know they're pulling, I know funds are being pulled out of Instagram now, now that the TikTok is going to be, well, if it does go, they can afford to just not pay their creators as much. Um, but Facebook is definitely something, or Meta, is something I need to take a look at. But, but I would like to be educated by you on it. Yeah. So I first learned about 
the potential of Facebook from, do you guys know the professor, the streetballer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so one of my, my biggest, biggest idols, I follow him on YouTube, and I remember hearing him on a podcast talking about business, and he said that he makes more money off of Facebook videos than YouTube, and his YouTube is huge. I was like, man, I'm missing out on something because a lot of my friends, they don't really use Facebook. I think in the Bay Area, it's maybe not as popular, but in Europe, in Asia, it's huge. It's actually, in terms of the user base, it's actually bigger than YouTube. And so I've been focused, I spent the last year trying to develop that platform. So I recently got monetized and trying to grow that as like another revenue stream. And that's why I started a second channel too, because I, I realized I couldn't depend solely on one revenue source. Um, that was going to be so fickle. So spreading it among multiple is 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 my goal. Did you uh do you post like the full video just like as if you went on YouTube on Facebook? No. Cut it up. So you have to. One way to not grow is if I I tried to just repost it, but you have to cut it up. the The f dimensions are different. So on Facebook, people watch it vertically. On YouTube, they watch it you know okay. landscape. So four by four or four by five. Um, and then they only have to be around three to six minutes or, and it's more highlight based. So if you want to do a game and that's a great way to repurpose it. So if you guys do one of your, what's it, alpaca, alpaca games, yeah, yeah, alpaca. alpaca games. So you do the long form point by point on YouTube, you know, nice 16 by nine HD. And then on Facebook, you cut it up to where it's only highlights, but it's a square format because people, it's more easier to view on that. 720 or something. Or I'll look at it. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. I can give you the dimensions. Um, I can. I look it up too. I'm not good with remembering the numbers. But you still want to HD. It's just a different format, so people can watch it vertically, and that's a great. It actually has a huge international appeal. So Meta is still not as big as YouTube in the U.S., but around the world, um, and it's a great way. And uh, for better or for worse, you can grow really fast through Facebook ads. So YouTube. Organic. I mean, you can grow through if you pay to for membership, or pay to to advertise and promote subscribers. But YouTube is more about organic growth, and you can grow really fast organically. Facebook, unfortunately, you got to pay to play, but you're guaranteed followers. So if you create ads, meaning just short versions of your videos, and then you you let the Facebook algorithm target people that are interested, you can get highly engaged followers pretty fast. How many followers do you have on Facebook? If you don't mind me asking. The 7,000 right now. Okay. okay. And then how long did it take you to get that? Three months. So a lot faster than my YouTube. Um, but just because I, I, I had to pay a lot. Like probably. What do you mean by pay? pay? So I paid. I have a Facebook, a really good Facebook coach consultant that I'd be happy to recommend to you guys if you, if you guys want to start that. Absolutely. Because I tried to grow organically for like a whole year and I just sucked big time. Zero growth. So that's why I started to reach out in the last three months, um, grew a lot more. But what he does is he creates small versions of your video and they just show up as ads. So as you're scrolling, it shows your short form version, like a wap Wapaka highlight. Mm -hmm. And so if you like this content, follow here. So once they click follow, they go to your page and they get to watch more stuff. Um, but if you don't pay, it's very, they prioritize paid ads. I mean, the ad is, is them placing it as a priority of the ver viewer scrolling through. Organically, you can do it, but it kind of shows up on the bottom. Um, so it's like a pay to play, but. How, how much do you usually cost? So you, it's, it's per day. Um, so I, it, it depends on the region. So there's three tiers of countries. There's tier one, which is the most expensive um, but the countries that give the most generous ad revenue, so people that advertise in the U.S. generally are going to give more um, ad revenue share. Um, you know, people in like the Philippines, you get an ad, but then the commission is not that big because people aren't paying that much money to advertise there. So you can set a, a limit where I only want five dollars a day, and then you let Facebook d advertise until it reaches that five dollar max. So it could be like three cents a follower. Or, or three cents in exposure, meaning every time they show that your video to get the follower in front of somebody, that will cost like one cent or two cent or three cents. Mm -hmm. It's up to them to click follow. But if you create a, if you target it well, if you have someone like the Facebook coach that knows how to, to really customize the system, you can get a very high, high follower return. Because when I did it myself, I would show this video, but I didn't edit it correctly. 
and it got exposed to all these people, and then no one followed me. I was like, oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the way this person edited it, which is, it just seems so low tech, but so Facebook savvy, that it was like a 50% return, like meaning every other person that saw it was following. So it grew, it grew to, that's why I grew to 55,000. That's impressive. Yeah, I mean, if you guys want, like, that down the road, I'd love, I'd love to help you guys to, to grow that. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, for sure. It's a, we're gonna be we're gonna be uh, in contact with you a lot this summer if you would love if you would have us. Awesome. We got we were talking about today too, getting dying down to L.A. We got to do a collab with us because Eric wants to do something. Shoji, us three, nice. triple collab. We should do something. That'd gotta do something. Else. Gotta be doing. And the McKibbins, we get the McKibbins in too. One mega. I think I think we could. I think because everyone's down there, it's just more. You got Eric with the USA. You got McKibbins with a family now. You got you live up here. If you come down here, you only got. And then us, we have clinics and whatnot. Christensen would be in. He lives right down the street too. Christensen lives in the neighboring town. He, we are in Hermosa, and he lives in Redondo. Oh, I didn't know that. that so he's not living in Hawaii anymore. So, so well, when he, because he over summers with An, in Anaheim training mostly. So his uh, his in laws are from Redondo. So I don't know. Maybe with that Kazan contract, crazy, he's in his own house man. now. <laughs> maybe yeah. maybe he doesn't live with his in laws anymore. <laughs> but. This idea, I was waiting to to ask you guys later. Um, I've been wanting to. We're in. <laughs> it was going to. I wanted to host like a a tournament, like a volleyball content creator tournament. So we each put our own teams and we just play. We just do a round robin play. One, I think it would just be super fun content. Um, do you know Better at Beach, Mark Birick? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So he puts an indoor. He played pro in Sweden before he became um, pro pro beach. He puts together the 16. You guys got your crew. I got my crew. I know the USA guys like Air Shoji. I don't know if he wants to risk that <laughs> for his contract. Yeah, yeah. That that's a tough, tough with tough with those guys. Eric sure. could put together a fun team. We would make him. He we'll could put like, together Eric a fun team. Be. Those guys are always down for something. Yeah. yeah. So. Just do like a, a team. Uh, Victoria Garrett could put it together a team. I don't know if she still mm -hmm. plays anymore, but I think that'd be fun to just have a tournament um, of content creators and then. So that should be two days. So I actually wanted to put together like a volleyball festival. So yeah. on Saturday, day like morning till night, just have people that want to advertise their clubs or whatever, and then all the content creators can have a booth, and then they pay to come in. They meet all the creators. We do some demos and stuff, and the next day would be the tournament where people could pay to play, to watch, to watch us, and just have fun and, and stuff like that. But and so where where would you want this tournament to be? Not sure yet, cause. Uh, Gym time's expensive. <laughs> yeah, so, so it would be, be indoor. indoor. It, yeah, indoor sixes. Um, I have. I mean, I could. I could get an affordable. So City Beach, I would get a discount, and they right. have four courts, lots of parking, and lots of table space for meet and greets, and a restaurant, and a bar. Um, that is actually now I think of it, literally everything right there, and then the court. You get, and then obviously, I, I do you know? Do you know? I don't know if they if they mind what it like a full facility rental what it goes for at City Beach. For the, for those wondering, this is a facility that has, like Gage said, it has everything: bar, restaurant, rock tables, climbing. rock climbing, everything like yeah. four courts. I don't know. I know they give me a pretty good discount just because they're one of our our team sponsors, mm -hmm. but I don't know what their going rate is. I know I know their corporate events are pretty expensive because um, they're in like the center of tech, so they do a lot of mm -hmm. corporate events there, but. Uh, I bet you could get somebody who would just give it to you for free in somewhere in the U.S. I bet, I bet for exposure, if, if you shout them out, I feel like you have. All I bet there's some creators. place out there who would give it to you for free of charge, almost. Yeah. That's a sick idea, though. Watch, somebody's gonna somebody's gonna comment on on this. You're like, I'll do it. So sorry for non-Californians. I'm not trying to purposely be biased, <laughs> but I think the density of population and the number of volleyball players would make it easier for more fans to attend. Well, also is, is yeah fans, but also is there a volleyball creator that's outside of California, like a notable one? Uh, P. The, there's a guy is rising. PME. I don't know what it stands yeah, oh, for. PME. He's in. Uh, He's playing college right now. Yeah. Barely. Wait a sec here. I gotta replace batteries. Sure. Shout, shout out to our shout out to our <laughs> Oh yeah. Let me work. So he's kind of been rising. Um, You know, you're good to get, you're good to get okay. to this camera. Uh, I'm trying. I'm just trying a total blank. 
Yeah, those are the only ones I, I could think. And then, of course, the McKibben brothers, you guys already mentioned that. I, and I think it would be super fun to make it a, a weekend where we can all collaborate on each other's content. Like, not just play, but like think about some fun things we can do with our entire audience uh, with yeah. each other. Yeah, because yeah, you said it's hard out here for volleyball creators, <laughs> especially a lot of time. Obviously, you're the most successful one, and for a reason. Um, but PM, I know PME is actually coming out for VNL, I'm pretty sure. So we're going to collab with them, try and then. I think it's early July, early July, 2nd through or yeah, 2nd through the 10th. Um, so he'll be out. We kind of talked to him. If you're out there, collab, 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 baby. Yeah, no, Anaheim. When is that? Yeah, July 2nd to 10th. July 2nd to 10th. Okay. I always forget to check that schedule. I just feel like there's just so much volleyball. Oh, so, so much. I'm having enough time tracking, like, trying to follow your guys' games, <laughs> which are hard to find. And then uh, the Polish League, and then the Russian League. And then uh, I always forget when VNL starts, so... Okay, July second. I'll, I'll I'll keep that in mind. I'll I'll hit, definitely hit you guys up. Definitely, definitely because we will be at we'll pack uh, uh we'll pack is actually that same weekend. So early in the week and then at the end of it is perfect for us because we're we'll pack is the we'll pack is the ninth. We have a clinic the seventh on that Thursday, and then we're back on the tenth. I think it ends on the tenth or whatever. Yeah, last last matches are on the tenth. So that's uh, so that's what. Well, like I said, whenever we're down, whenever you're down, obviously, you gotta spend time with the wife. Gotta actually enjoy your vacation. <laughs> like, I get that. I get that. Like, uh, but like I said, when you're down there, man, we gotta we gotta hit each other up. Um, but that's a sick idea. That's a sick idea. It's just, it's hard because, for example, you have a basketball creator. His main job is being a basketball creator. They can afford that. They can do all this stuff. It's mainstream. Football creators are have other professions as well, like professional football player doing, you know, and they're off season doesn't include an off season just training it includes eric shows you like national team and all this other stuff um uh but yeah and then and then if you yeah so it, it it's dip, it can be difficult but it can be done i think it begins so calorie the best because yeah, yeah. you could then you could snag like you said you could get the mckibbins you can get eric there because he lives there you can get yeah i think that's the best place to go southern california yeah if we have any listeners that have a facility that want to get some free promo promotion Hey, Coach, Coach Donnie. Donnie up, leave in the comment section for sure. Donnie, I have a, a few, what, one or two more questions before you let you off here. Um, you're a big shoe guy. I am, Joe is not a big shoe guy whatsoever. Uh, but, but but I respect that because he's kind of a guy. <laughs> As you can see, Donnie checking our shoe game. Got the new Asics, got the new Pizza Makers 2.0s on his feet. Yeah, these are five years old right here. Hey, but hey, old but gold. Old but gold. They got the Ultra Boost on. Everyone fit check, fit check, fit check. Um... I'm kind of in a medium where I pay attention to it. I pay attention to it a lot more when I was in club. And then in college, they give you shoes. I'm like, I'm not going to go buy shoes. I got five pairs. Yeah. Overseas, I'm like, you know what? I can play anything. They give me Adidas okay shoes, you know, um, certain ones that we got. I ended up playing these mid-top. I Actually, Mizuno is super underrated in my opinion now. But mid-top, I think Wave Momentums, black. Yeah, and and I just kind of did it as a joke because it just looks terrible with an all red jersey, white socks, and those on. So it's kind of a joke at the end of the year. But I actually liked them. But now I I literally don't have own a pair because I just threw them all away because I just wear through them quickly. But I want to hear your top five volleyball shoes, and then I have another question to ask on top of that. I got to separate this into two categories because there's basketball shoes that I use for volleyball, mm. and then just pure volleyball shoes. Um, I actually didn't start getting into shoes until probably seven years ago. And it's thanks to my other volleyball content creator friend, Josh Perino. He's kind of a sneakerhead. Um, he kind of, he showed me the, like how much shoes can impact your ability to feel comfortable to play. So right now, I would say the Sky Elite MFT. Okay, this is from a hitter's perspective. Cause I think there's different shoes that are good for liberos, for middles, setters mm -hmm. and then different body types so like the bigger athletes they need a lot of cushion have you guys ever wore the LeBron, any lebron james shoes i, I have wore worn lebron james shoes bulky get very comfortable a lot of cushion just yeah. yeah but you got to carry a 220 6 8 frame right but what, what about, about the, the new ones way? i heard the new ones are pretty lightweight mm -hmm. um but i wouldn't know i haven't worn them yeah, i'm still going to try them out but i've heard they're more on the lighter side um, 
So in terms of, if I just had to choose one to wear, it would be the Sky Elite MFTs. Um, now I can't wear them anymore because my feet are so wide. Uh, and so that hurts my pinky toe because they are narrow in the toe box, unfortunately. But when I was able to tolerate wearing them, the best traction, even on dusty floors, great lateral support, very springy. So you ha it has a thicker sole, but stiffer. So that when the rubber is stiffer, it, it bounces more. And I'm sure you experience with the boost, it kind of absorbs a little bit with the boost technology. It kind of mm -hmm. sits more. I don't like, as a jumper, you don't want things to absorb. You just want to spring off the floor. But maybe as a, a middle that needs to that doesn't need a max jump, but just needs to handle lots of jumping, you need that cushion. Um, and then setters, you guys need, need to be super light on their feet. So I think Mizuno's are good. So the second one would probably be uh, gotta gotta keep my volleyball shoes in check. Okay, second or third before I forget would be the Wave Momentum Twos. Underrated. Those are really solid shoes. The, I think the Dominican women's team might be the only team that just wears them exclusively. Um, so I would put that as number two or three. Um, it's, it's, it's just a very well-balanced shoe. You get just enough spring. It's not going to be springy as the Asics uh, Sky Elite, but enough. You get good lateral support, good, good traction, um, and great for wide feet. And actually, people's feet should be wide because... You want your toes to be able to spread, and and it's really important that people have space for their toes to grip the floor. When you when you compress your toes, you get LeBron. James. Have you guys seen LeBron James' pinky toe? No. Oh, it's like it's crushed. It looks oh pretty bad. Oh my back. god! But Nike runs thin though a lot of time for their shoes, so that's tough. Yeah, they do have a little on the on the upper for sure. Um, gosh, you know, I just there's not a lot of good volleyball shoes out there, unfortunately. Those are only the two that I can think of. And I, I'm I'm purposely not naming any Adidas shoes because I just don't think any of the Adidas volleyball shoes are that good. That you're part, talking about you're talking about like volleyball centric shoes, not like the basketball for okay. Yeah, their shoes, the crazy flights, um, whatever other names, the old shoelaces shoes. suck too. Yeah. Oh, those thing we, we were wearing crazy flights this year. They just and break in the middle of games all the time. Ripping, literally, first use. Like just pull, there's like the heels yeah. coming out. Everything was. I was like, "What the crap is yeah. going on?" Like, it's not a very durable shoe. No. Um, the boost technology, I'm not a fan of because it's it's too much. It's slow compression, um, and I, I just feel like my foot's coming off the shoe. So there's not an, the um, like what we call the outrigger. So the outer edge of the shoe, there's not a really pronounced outrigger. So your foot goes past the sole when you have an angle on this then it kind of presses back against your foot so it doesn't slide off the shoe. That's really dangerous, yeah, when it goes over. I feel like yeah. knee injuries, I feel like, are prone. Yeah. Outrigger and having a durable enough material right on the outside edge to keep, so you can change direction. Um, and especially for big jumpers, you need a really pronounced outrigger to, to transfer your momentum from ver horizontal to vertical. Yeah, that's the, honestly, that's the only two volleyball shoes Okay, if I had to throw like a universal, this is good for everybody and you can't go wrong with it, the Nike Hyper Ace 2. Mm. So they look ugly as hell. Stanford <laughs> wears them. Uh, pretty ugly. Uh, they don't give you any spring. They also, the traction is decent, but in terms of you're not going to injure yourself and you can play hard and it's really durable, that's a good shoe. Like, if I just had to recommend something, like, just what's a good starter shoe, I would say the Nike Hyper Ace if you're not hardcore about amplifying your performance as Nike Hyper Ace. So I would rank it like that. Sky Elite, um, Mizuno Wave Momentum 2, and then the, yeah, the Hyper Ace 2. Oh, crap. What, what about, about uh, Micah? Tried the Tokyo, the Asics Tokyo. <laughs> And he said those were trash. But everybody buys them. Internationally, they're huge, too. And obviously, Nishida pulls a big weight in that. You know what I'm saying? He wears them a lot. And I was like, oh, I need to be like Nishida. Give me the, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I was like, where's the Tokyo? And those things are like $200, like $250. I'm like, what the heck? I'm like. I personally haven't tried them, but I think they're pretty identical to the Sky Elites. Um, I'm curious why Micah didn't like them. But. I think it's more of a a, a max jumping, like one-off jump 
type of shoe, meaning if I'm not having to max jump all the time, I'm not gonna feel the benefit and it's just gonna feel like a shoe that's too high off the ground. Like when I think of setter movements, it's a lot of kind of shuffling side to side, getting under the ball and then just skipping up. So you don't need that much. And so you don't want a shoe as a setter that's too high off the ground. Cause then you kind of feel like you, you need to feel in one, you need to feel like the ground, right? Like I think liberos and setters, you need to feel the floor to know that I am in a good space or like have control. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 100%. Yeah. Also hitters and opposites, it's like, just give me something that I can max jump in. I don't need to feel the floor, just, just get me off the floor. And then what about basketball, basketball shoes to use? Or basketball shoes, um, they don't make the same more, but Kobe sixes, in my yeah. opinion, are like the all time. <sighs> so good. Rest in peace. Like that was the best shoe overall. The Pro Tros, unfortunately, they always find ways to mess it up. They should have just remade it exactly was. Um, the Kobe 6s, probably number one. Um, I'm currently really liking the Dame 8s. So, I think you're wearing them. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah, the Dame 8s are, in terms of just the amount of spring, like for me, when I look for a shoe, I, I want to make sure it has a wide toe box so your toes can spread and grip the floor and change direction. But I maybe because I'm a shorter athlete and I'm so dependent on my vertical that I need something that's going to be really, really springy. But it's a good combination of really springy and great shock absorption and, and um, very durable. Uh, I know the Barrows, they, they scuff up a lot right, oh, right yeah. here. Also, I also, I run through laces right there on my right, especially because I guess I dive mainly on my right side. Yeah. I will go shoot, I will go through shoelaces every week, yeah. every week, every other week, easily. And the Mizuno upper is really durable. I, do you wear Mizunos right now? Yeah. yeah. Well, before I threw all my shoes away, before I threw them all up on the, you know, when you throw shoes up on a wire, there's a big shoe rack in Lunenburg and I threw them all up there because they were old, <laughs> but they're there now, but I used to, yes, yes. Leave yes. our mark. Yeah, exactly. Anybody in Lunaburg wants free shoes. <laughs> Cut down hanging, the wire. hanging downtown. So yes, to answer your question, yes, I did. Okay. Yeah. yeah, those are super durable. Um, and then the third basketball shoe. Ah, I can't think of one. What about um, uh, Dames? The, he always said the Dame Aids. He wears the Dame Aids. What about Hardest? What are your thoughts on Hard? Well, Irving, I've I've seen. A lot of Kyrie Irving. I've seen a lot of Giannis. Any of the Under Armors? Any Curries? Dude, Curries? Oh my God! Don't even get started on Curries, bro. Don't even get me started on Curries, bro. We had those for Hawaii, bro. I look like I was like these are made of foam. I was like I'm wearing the Storm Trooper, whatever these things are. This is the, I'm like what am I wearing right now? I would just destroy those things, destroy them. I tried Curries. I tried um, the Kyries. The Kyries are too stiff. I, I feel like there's no give in the upper, no flexibility, and the sole is really responsive. So actually it might be a good libero shoe because it kind of locks your foot in place so you can be really light and, and fast on your feet. But for me, the heel-toe transition just didn't feel right. So like as a jumper, your right-left plant, the, the heel-toe transition is, is really critical. And if the middle of the sole is too rigid and it doesn't flex, you can't roll. It just kind of slaps the ground and then you got to yeah, jump off. Yeah, I know exactly. exactly what that is. Yeah. And I would have issues with my arch. And especially since you're a big jumper on, on jump setting, like yeah. you're not just a hop shuffle, you're like a full yeah. approach. Yeah, so those were, were not that great for that. Um, the hardens, man, probably in my opinion, the one of the the worst series of basketball shoes known to man. <laughs> really, <laughs> maybe they had one. I heard the grip, grip is pretty, pretty trash too. Uh, it's so bad, and which is crazy because I, I do believe that um, the top athletes have a lot of say, and they do customize the shoes. Um, and hypothetically, they could just make a shoe that looks like their shoe, and then they can mess with the inside just for that, and and then sell the regular shoe for marketing. But I think about the way the athletes move. Harden is not a big jumper. He's not that shifty. He just has one step back move, and then that's mm -hmm. it. He's just a great shooter. And so the fact that, and then his, his has no shock absorption. So when you don't jump that high, you need to feel the ground more so you can just kind of move kind of like a libero. Um, and so I just never liked that about the shoe. Terrible traction. He's not the fastest guy, so he doesn't need that. And some athletes, they actually want a little bit of slide. Um, so... Here's a side note on the Sky Elites. 
I wouldn't recommend those for liberos because the traction is so good that when you try to stop, your body will keep going. It, it will literally just stop your foot and then you'll keep going. Aye. But I think liberos, they need enough stickiness, but enough slide so that as I'm kind of getting into position, it can kind of decelerate and I can feel that that inch into it. I don't know if you've ever, if yeah. you know what I mean. No, I know exactly, exactly what you mean. My favorite personal volleyball shoes of all time, I don't know if you've heard of them, actually are Under Armour. Under Armour Heat Seekers. They don't make them anymore. I had to start, I had to order them from the UK. I remember I got them one year in Hawaii and we got like three or four pairs. And so they, I made them last somehow. I only played them on game days and like serving past uh, uh, day of game. And they were like a sock on your foot, but great. And maybe, maybe for hitters, they're not great. Maybe you hate them. But for Liberos, oh my God, they were light and explosive. And just, it was like a, a sock on your foot. But that was like, usually with socks on your feet, they don't have great angle mobility. Uh, or they have really loose ankle mobility, or like you can fall over, like literally fall over the side of your. Like if I train, like if I played ultra boosts, like I said, very comfortable, feels like a sock, but I would fall over the side of it. Not great for like stopping uh, horizontal movement. But those, they did everything great. I was like, and they stopped making it after a year. I'm like what happened? And then um, um, they just don't continue anymore. But what do you say the most? But is there a shoe you have a name that's like the most overrated one? Or you're like these ones. For me, I'm trying to think what mine would be. I think mine would be something along the lines of curry. Yeah, curry. I think I think I made that, I think I made that abundantly clear. I've tried the threes, the fours, the storms. Oh my god! Don't even give me. Oh man, I used to tear through those things like hot. Clay's shoes, I heard trash too. Tragic. Whatever. Whatever those. Are they also uh, brand, anti? Weird brand. Are they anti? No. I, I, yeah, I, have yeah. you heard of Wave the Wades? Are those any good? I've heard those are actually not bad. I, I've heard a lot of great things from all the sneakerheads and a couple of all the players that I know. Uh, so should be coming in next, like a week or two, but I, I just ordered them. I, I'm pretty excited because I think anytime you have an independent company that's a real athlete wanting to do it right their own way, I think it's going to be good. Awesome. So I'll let you guys know when, when, I, when I test them out. Well, let, let us know, brother. Hey, I just want to say, um, uh, Donnie, we couldn't be more happy to get you on the pod, man. And hopefully... Uh, like I said, we're up in the, up in uh, Northern California quite a bit this summer. Um, we can um, we can get you another pod and maybe get other guests too and collab as many. Do you have one more thing, Joe? Before I, I was just saying, we, we have a note uh, from the team outside practice saying that they wanted you, Coach Donnie. <laughs> uh, let's go, Coach. So also, also, I apologize, Coach Donnie, and to our listeners out there if they heard screeching. I mean, screeching, just g- little girls. Um, my dad runs a very tight ship, very strict. Very intense practice, so you know those are those are cheers of joy for so they don't get Roger's punishment. No, I'm just kidding. No, um, yeah, exactly. But um, before we hop off here again, the elevate yourself, Coach Donnie. Uh, everything that he had mentioned in terms of his classes, you want to? I'll give you a chance to plug everything. It'll everything will be linked in the bio uh, that you say here. So you can follow me on Instagram, TikTok. Twitter that I don't respond to much, but Facebook, I think the Facebook one is where I'm going to start be posting a lot more. So that one's Coach Donnie, Elevate Yourself. Um, and also, if you're in the area, um, I'm starting to do more adult volleyball camps. I have girls volleyball high school camps coming up at the end of the summer. Um, but even if you're out of town, come and I'd love to work with you and, and help you improve your volleyball skills. So yeah, that's it. And I just went through some of his training today and I guarantee you it will make you better and you will feel a lot better also physically. I feel like a new man. My uh, my hips feel like a new man. So uh, make sure you hit those up. And with that being said, also I want to give a quick shout out to our friends at AllVolleyball.com. Use a promo code OOS for 20% off for all your volleyball needs. They are the number one volleyball manufacturer for a reason. Because they got it. You want it? They got it. All these shoes we're talking about, majority of them, they got it. You know what I'm saying? With that being said, um, uh, if you can't handle the heat. Yeah, the damn kitchen. This has been another episode presented by AllVolleyball.com. Thank you.